Our text this morning is again from the Gospel of Mark. And in this particular instance, Jesus gets himself in trouble early on. He's just not religious enough. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the, at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Jesus heard him, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have to come call, to call those who think they are righteous, not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? And Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating the groom, with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And who puts new wine into old wineskins? For the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Well, even on vacation, I go to church, kind of check out, see what the competition's up to. <laughs> and um, on one particular Sunday morning, a, a couple of summers ago, I, I went to this church. It had a, had a wonderful reputation, at least reputation-wise. And I don't ordinarily listen for this kind of thing, but it was stunning to me that the only reference to God or Jesus was in the hymns or in the liturgy. It's one of those liturgical type churches where you read everything. And the sermon was highly political and talking about how Christians should resist and should fight and should resist and fight, and it was all about a political sort of thing. And I came out of there and I wondered, well, <laughs> why bother? I can get that political stuff all day, every day from MSNBC or Fox or whatever. I don't, I don't need that when I go to church. But it had the appearance of religion it had a facade of religion, but it was almost, it struck me as religion without, without faith, without something in the middle of a, a, a fiery burning coal of faith that animated everything else. And it's no surprise to me, we have a whole generation of people, younger people, who are leaving any kind of religious organizations, churches or whatever. And they call themselves spiritual but not religious, whatever that means. Spiritual but not religious, but they have had it up to here with religion. But I would contend they have yet to understand or even to appropriate what it means to have faith. Because faith is the vibrant reality. Let's face it, Christianity is as religion is one thing, but the faith that animates Christianity is something very different. It's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus 
and it empowers the, the Spirit of God to animate our lives and to, to make us a changed people. And then we put some structure around that that constitutes the work of the church. But without that, if that center is gone, then religious observance becomes rather absurd, becomes empty, meaningless. And then people go for the music, the stained, the stained glass, like our plastic stained glass here. They go for the, the, the wrappings and the trappings, but there's no middle to it. There's no substance to it. There's no source to it. That's why it's so important that in the life of faith, as we exercise our faith in and through the church, which God has ordained to be the bearer of his good news, that, that we stay close to that core, that, that vibrant reality at the base and the bottom and the middle of all things. So Jesus, walking along in the shores of the Sea of Galilee, sees a booth <laughs> with a tax collector in it. And of all people, Jesus goes to him, Levi, or Matthew, asks him to come and follow him. And he does, Levi does, he follows Jesus. This is a tax collector, this is a collaborationist with Rome. He's one of the bad guys. In fact, to the, to the Jews, if a tax collector entered your home, you and your whole household were rendered unclean, ritually unclean. The only thing worse was a leper. So tax collectors, well, maybe it's not so different today than then, but tax collectors <laughs> would, would render the whole household unclean, but he calls Levi and brings him into his inner circle. Along with the other, the four guys he'd already called, they're all fishermen, just good Jewish boys, but they hardworking young men, and then they bring in this tax collector, kind of broke their way of thinking in, in incorporating him into their circle of friends. And then Levi has Jesus and the disciples over to his house. And as one might expect, when one is excluded from nice people, when one is set apart from the respectable crowd of good religious people, well, he makes friends elsewhere. So he made friends with all kinds of other people, other tax collectors and what the Jews would call sinners. That constitutes all kinds of stuff. And we can let our minds run, run wild. I kind of like the fact that in the, in the King James Version, the tax collectors are referred to as publicans. I was going to throw that in. Why, or the Pharisee says, why do these, why do these, why does Jesus and his disciples, why do they eat with sinners and republicans? <laughs> but I didn't do it. I, I saved that. But these detestable people. Jesus is with them. Why does he eat with people like that? And they ask because they're religious and Jesus is with those people because he is embodying, bringing, inspiring faith. The faith that represents the God who is in constant pursuit of you and me and, and everyone we know. There's no one outside of his circle of compassion. No one whom he does not pursue. So the religious questions persist. Then the next one is, well, why doesn't Jesus and his, why don't Jesus and his disciples fast like John and his disciples did? He's just not religious enough. He's not setting apart those days that we consider to be holy. He's not demonstrating his his religion rightly by failing to fast. And, and then on another occasion, Jesus is walking through a field and with his disciples, the guys are hungry and they start picking some, 
some corn off of the stalks and they're walking along and eating this corn and then the, the Pharisees, the religious people were saying, well, why do they eat on the Sabbath? They pick those things on the Sabbath. That's a violation of law. It's a violation of religion. But Jesus is always affirming life, affirming faith, affirming who we are, affirming people in pursuit of you and me, always to embrace us and allowing the, the power of love to transform us according to his will. And it's not about following a bunch of rules and regulations. Anyone who believes that this faith is about taking on a bunch of rules and regulations hasn't, understa and hasn't understood the nature of God's grace and the reality of God's embrace. For he loves us and accepts us and calls us just as we are. Just as we are. But that question persists. As one who is religious looks at the life of Jesus, it's why doesn't he this and why does he that? and Why would he eat with those kind of people? Why would he do this? I had a fascinating experience recently. I was sharing with my class that my circle of compassion has some real limitations. God's does not. But we all have our level of, I mean, limits to our levels of compassion. There are certain people who, are, who fall outside of our capability of showing love and care. And I made, it was after class, I was chatting away and saying, you know, I, I just can't deal with somebody who messes with kids. My circle just can't bring them in. As I was saying that, a young man who had been working with me out of North Naples Regional Park as a coach was being arrested. And there I was facing the reality. And the question in my own heart and mind had to do with that which, which the Pharisees asked Jesus, why would you coach with someone like that? Of course, I didn't know. But the question persists, why would you eat or drink or share time with or, or do anything with such scum? That's the religious question. The faith answer is, as Jesus said, people who are well, who think they're well, don't need a doctor. Those who have the humility to recognize their need, I'm there for them. Subsequently, I had a video visit over the phone or at, at, the, at the jail where you can hook up with inmates. Oddly enough, a pastor can't go in anymore. But uh, I had this visit, and he made the comment. He said, and by the way, this gentleman was all over the news here in southwest Florida. He said, this had to happen. This was necessary to happen. And as he's talking and as I'm looking at him, he looks like the same guy I'd work with, but I just, I had a hard time. Because Jesus asks us, why wouldn't you show care? Why would you exclude from your circle those whom I include? Why would you not care for those whom I care for deeply. So the faith, the reality of faith, drives us to connect and to embrace and care for people that we never would have dreamed that our Lord would, 
would call us to love. This past week up in, up in Clearwater, the meeting that I had with this faith-based, community-based advisory council for the legislature and the governor, there was a presentation by a group called um, Dream Florida. And this is a group that was founded by a man who was a successful businessman, went into the ministry, worked with a non-denominational church, and then started reaching out to people who fell beneath the line of social services. People living under bridges. People living in utter squalor. People engaged in drug abuse and prostitution. He showed the picture of a, a mattress under a bridge surrounded by all kinds of clothes and junk and a little outdoor stove. A man, because of his drug abuse, who was dying of AIDS, and his wife, who insisted that she would stay with him and sleep there under the bridge with him until he died. Another man whose home was infested with rats and out of whose home he was trading drugs and, and prostitution, huge black man who who was so far away from anything representing or, or reflecting the reality of faith. And this man, this pastor went in, day in, day out, week in, week out, worked with him to clean up his place, began to talk him out of doing what he was doing. And finally, after six weeks, he asked him, what is it you really want? because I want to pray with you, because I think I've deserved the right to pray with you after all this time. And he said, I want my five children back. His wife was imprisoned, and his five children, ranging from seven to 18, were living in foster homes up in Alabama and Mississippi. He said, I want my children back. So the pastor prayed with him and asked that God would restore his family. That man began to work with the pastor, helping that pastor break down more such horrific circumstances that existed in the community up in Pinellas County. Time after time after time. And his life was slowly being transformed. And then they parted their ways. A year and a half later, he got a phone call from this man. He said, Pastor, I want you to come over. Came over. He went to the house. It'd been freshly painted. The lawn was trimmed and neat. There were flowers planted, there were pots on the front porch. He knocked on the door, went in, was greeted by a little nine-year-old girl. He came in and he saw this family reunited. And he met this man who met him with a great, huge embrace. And he said, thank you. I've got my family back and my wife. As he said, Jesus didn't hold office hours and wait for people to come to him. He went out and sought them. He sought them out. And others may ask, well, why would you do this with such scum? The circumstances are horrific. Our minds, most of our minds, because we haven't been exposed to it, can't even go to the level, the depths of deprivation that some people endure, that some people suffer. But our faith takes us there. Religion doesn't. Only with a vibrant, real faith in our Lord 
who loves us and cares for us even as we are and who loves them and cares for them despite our defining them out with our own circle of compassion. He loves them and cares for them. And thank God, he calls all of us, even you and me. And so our Lord, in not honoring the religion of his time, not entirely, instead embodied the very presence of God with us. And that is the vibrant, animating reality of faith in our hearts and lives. So with that, you know, I could take off the robe. We could peel down the stained glass. We don't have to get rid of pews because we have these swell chairs. <laughs> but we could do whatever it takes to not even demonstrate any of the wrappings and trappings of religion, but if we have that vibrant reality of faith, we are his church. Will you bow with me in prayer? And thank you, O Lord. We are not all that you have intended us to be, but one day we will by your strength and power, be all that you've made us to be. Thank you, O Lord, for the high calling that is ours in Christ. And thank you, O Lord, that we can number ourselves among the outcasts. We can number ourselves among those whom Jesus tenderly calls. We thank you in his name.